Hey everybody, my name is Uche and I'm a PM on the Azure Developer Experience team. Hi everyone, my name is Kate and I work on Azure Developer Experience as well. Today, I would love to go through a demo of building our own cloud native application. I've written many applications before, but I've always been curious as to how I could build my own cloud native application. So let's start from scratch. What is your definition of cloud native, Uche? Love the question. Well, cloud native is really about building an application that is designed to be in the cloud. And what that really means is taking application code and dependencies, packaging it in containers, deploying them as microservices, and exposing them as APIs. Then we manage the deployment of our microservices using the DevOps processes and tools. That makes a lot of sense. But why should we make our application cloud native in the first place? That's a great question, Kate. First off, using cloud native technology enables a developer to achieve faster deployment and incident recovery. By developing the test, uh, sorry, by developing and testing code in environments such as containers, which are identical or near identical um, to production compared to the host machine, developers can code with greater confidence and less errors. Also, by establishing DevOps practices, we give developers reproducible deployments, and we can set up platforms such as AppConfig to manage access to secrets, dependencies, and feature flags across all our services. Altogether, this, cre this increases responsibility to our customers' needs and shortens the time to market. All right, that sounds really good. And also, it sounds to me like in a complex application architecture, um, there are usually probably multiple teams working on many services. So a microservice approach saves us time during development because developers focus on creating loosely coupled collections of services. They can then independently release and troubleshoot. So this keeps all of our concerns separate. And then developer just needs to, you know, focus on debugging their application code and managing inbound and outbound API calls without having to worry about the entire larger system. Yeah, exactly. This promotes a tighter inner loop and continuous delivery. It's important to note that cloud native applications use cloud native services as much as possible because doing so eliminates the need for that on-prem hardware and in-house security. We set you up with cloud infrastructure so you no longer have to worry about the network being throttled or a server going down because cloud native services in Azure, such as Azure Kubernetes service, will take care of scaling to meet demand. Ultimately, this makes your product highly available and reliable. Okay, so you mentioned security and you know this sounds good, but how does running our services in the cloud make our application really more secure? Isn't it always better and safer to be on-prem? Mm, that's a question we hear a lot, but Microsoft's greatest mission is to keep your data secure. With cloud native technologies, your company gets distributed secret management around the world and role-based access to resources via Azure Active Directory. You can automate security checks and run intelligent threat detection, which gives you protection in real time. We also give teams the power to put guardrails at any stage from code to cloud. You can use Azure SDKs to authenticate and access Azure services securely, deploy your application through secure channels to platform services such as Azure Container Instances or AKS as we mentioned, and monitor your application in the cloud with first party tools such as Application Insights or third party tools such as Datadog. I firmly believe by investing the time early on to use developer tools and leverage managed services, then setting up automated deployment processes, you'll soon save much more time by letting the cloud work for you. Now that we've talked about why, let's take a look at an app that really illustrates how to take advantage of Azure's combination of cloud native services and offerings, such as developer tools, and DevOps systems that you mentioned. Um, to really bring the benefits of cloud native to your development experience. Awesome. So when we approach cloud native, we think about two things, coding a cloud native app and following a cloud native process. We start by thinking about the smallest job to do and separate each job into its own microservice. The first service could be a login service. The second could be a service that handles adding items to a cart and the third could handle the purchasing of those items. Containers allow us to give each service a portable environment for autonomous execution and scaling. 
Although containers are just one way to run an application, by running our microservices in containers, we create a deployable unit that we know will run the same anywhere. Also, as a good design point, we expose everything in APIs, which provides a consistent contract and interface between the parts of the application. As another option, serverless computing, such as Azure Functions, is an execution model that allows you to develop code, sorry, to deploy code to our platform and have it triggered on an as called basis. When you use a function, it's hosted in Azure and can be configured to interact with various Azure resources. As for production, DevOps pipelines like GitHub Actions reliably deploy code in a repeatable fashion, and we use monitoring to track performance and reliability. So now that we've spoken about why cloud native is important, let's bring everything together with a practical example. So Kate's about to explain the architecture of a relatively simple app that analyzes meme photos to determine the sentiment of the photo's text. All right, thanks. So when we designed this app, we really wanted to have separate microservices that we felt like members of our team could independently work on. So here's how we built it. Uh, at first, we needed a front-end application that would allow a user to upload an image to our backend. We chose to go with Blazor WebAssembly because it's a great uh, .NET framework for building single-page applications, and that's really all we needed here. The service that is actually responsible for uploading the image is an ASP.NET Core app. You can notice here that we use a lot of platform-as-a-service services such as Storage Blob and Storage Queues as much as possible so that we can make our job easier. Azure Blob Storage stores the image you upload while the storage queue stores a message that is being picked up by our next service. That next service you can see on the right is the image analyzer, which is running a Python service for pulling messages of the queue and using, using Azure Cognitive Services to determine the sentiment of the image by first extracting the text from the image through OCR and then analyzing the extracted text. We chose green for positive sentiment and red for negative so that we can easily maybe take a look on the other positive ones. Lastly, we required a notification service to alert the pieces of our app on a need to know basis about new processed images. We chose to use Signal R service to alert the front end that a sentiment has been determined and then update the web page with a colored border to signify its sentiment. Yeah, to follow best practices, we don't store any secrets in code. All of the secrets are picked up from environment variables in our initial local Azure CLI login and propagated thanks to Azure Identity Library. We're using Azure App Config to store flags for some of the features we built in, such as the borders. To run our entire app, we chose Azure Kubernetes Service because it's great at orchestrating high-scale containers. Altogether, we built this app in a cloud-native style, so it's ready to scale, and it'll help our team deploy and iterate very quickly. Now, I'll pass it off to Kate so we can take a look at the code. All right, let's get started. The first step for us is going to focus on writing the actual application and writing the actual code that um, our microservices are going to be using once they are deployed. So I already cloned the repo that I am working off, uh, but just so that you can get access to it, you can just go to aka.ms slash memalizer. Um, and you can find all of the information there on how to get started if you need it later. All right. So just to have a quick look at what we have here and so that you can get a good understanding of where we are. Uh, we have all of the different concerns kind of separated. So we have um, one directory where we're going to have all of the resources related to setting up our infrastructure. We're going to talk about that in a bit. Here uh, we have all of the resources that we need to deploy all of our code later to Kubernetes. The last step is our code. We have the service written in both .NET and the Python that I mentioned. Uh, where you can see the actual applications that um, 
we're having run in the cloud. So let's take a look at how the service actually looks like. So this is our main service that actually retrieves the messages from, uh, from the queue and then is using them to send the images to analyze them, extract the text with form recognizer, send it to text analytics to get the sentiment, and then store it in Cosmos as the database. You can see that um, we're using a couple of libraries that are specific to Azure. Um, so all of these are new libraries that we've recently started um, releasing that should make it really easy to get up and running. You see, one thing that I would want to call out is an Azure Identity Library, which allows us to um, authenticate throughout the cloud. So no matter if you're um, using your local development and are setting up the code, or if you're just you know, um, releasing your application to the cloud, it should work out of the box throughout all of Azure. All right. So as a good practice, we try not to store any credentials in the code. Um, so we just pick up all of the all of the credentials from the environment variables that we set up for for the entire application, and um, we can now have a look at our logic of the application. Um, so you'll see that um, the the libraries that are use that we are using are following the same kind of design principles. Um, so we basically, in order to interact with each of these services, we need one client. So we have a form recognizer client, text analytics client, uh, Equivalent secrets client, and so on, um, which, which basically all take as a credential um, the endpoint and uh, the credentials that we get from the Azure Identity Library. So you can see that the, the pattern is really simple to follow. So as, as once you figure it out for one of them, you can um, get the rest of them running. Then all of the operations for each of the services are going to be stemming right off that main client. Um, so we receive all of the messages from Q, um, and then we pass them on later uh, to, to make sure that uh, we process all of the different images that we get. So as the first step, um, we recognize the content that we see in the image using the form recognizer client, and we just pull it to get our results ready. And it's really as simple as just one call. Uh, from the response that we get, we just extract the message in the code and then send it um, to text analytics. Again, you can see it's just this one, uh, one line of code here where we just run the analyze sentiment on the text analytics client using the message that we sent. Um, then all of this is what we save in the Cosmos DB so that we can retrieve it later and, and just maintain it. And the last steps for us are to make sure our queue is, queue is in place. Um, so we just delete all of the, the message that's no longer needed. And that's really as simple as it gets. Um, this should be really straightforward. Um, so all of the libraries that we've written uh, try to make sure that the code is actually idiomatic to the language in which it's developed. So we focus on making sure that the Python code actually does look like Python. Uh, for comparison, I can show you the exact same service um, in .NET. You'll notice that the content looks actually a bit different. Um, so basically, well, the logic is still the same. We get the messages from the queue, and then for all of the all of the messages in the form recognizer client, uh, we recognize the images. We then wait for the completion. So you'll see the same patterns being pretty similar across all of them. Uh, but the actual implementation is uh, is what you would expect in each of these languages. That's it for the main application. Um, so the next thing that we're going to need is to really look at um, all of the files that we need to get in place so that we can containerize all of our application and deploy it later at microservices. So now I'll get Uche to explain that part. Awesome. So one great aspect about containers is if we want to inject certain environment variables, 
or set which port a container is going to interact with, or maybe anything else, we can make these modifications in a Docker file. Authoring, the, authoring these Docker files alone can be tricky, but developer tools such as the Docker extension make it easier to get syntax highlighting, build and run containers, and even deploy our images to multiple cloud platforms. Because I'm using the Docker extension, let me show you. When I hit control space, I get what we love to call IntelliSense. So these are some helpful hints and suggestions that can help me author my Docker file. Now when I hit tab, I'm going to type in app equals development. In this case, you can imagine that maybe this environment variable enables us to, to start verbose logging. So the Docker extension is also the reason why we're able to right-click directly on a Docker file and either build this image and publish it directly to an Azure Container Registry or build, an, or build the image locally. Um, an Azure Container Registry, to put it simply, is basically a GitHub repository for your images. It's a place that stores it. So a Docker image itself is a static template that contains instructions for selecting system components and installing dependencies to create an environment for running, applica running your application code. Depending on how you set up your services, let me save this real quick, you may want to use Docker Compose. It's another way we could run our entire app because this file allows you to put each service into separate containers on the same Docker network so they can communicate with each other. The only interfaces between these services are APIs. We can see that the Docker Compose file builds all the images we need for our app and makes it ultimately easy to deploy our entire architecture. Now, before we get all the way to deploying to Kubernetes, what if we wanted to just make our application run on Azure just to see? Well, Azure Container Instances allows us to run a single or grouping of containers on Azure without configuring a Kubernetes cluster to handle orchestration and scaling. How would we do that? How would we run an ACI? Let's let's take you through. The Docker team did a really great job. The sorry, the Docker team did do a great job, but the Container Tools team at Microsoft also did a great job to collaborate with Docker to make ACI integration seamless. So I'm going to show you how this works. Right now we're in my default Docker context. This is why on my local machine you can see I'm running multiple containers and I have multiple images. So what I could do is I could actually add a context, add a Docker context such as let's say web app for fun. And what this does is it's a link, just a link between my subscription and resource group so that um, you can easily target, you can use the Docker CLI to target all of your containers that ru are running in your container registry. So here I'm going to go ahead and select, um, select one of my subscriptions and go ahead and put it up in the sky. So right here, it's as simple as clicking right-click, use, and when you do when we do this we're now looking into our we're now looking into instances of our ACI our instances running in Azure for this research source group so now that I've created this context I'm going to go ahead and show you what I can do so I already have images that I pushed to my registry my Azure container registry and I'm going to right click deploy this image directly to container instances. So when I do that, I can deploy it to a specific container. Um, as long as it's a Azure subscription, I can deploy to ACI. I can deploy to it, this, uh, this Docker context. So I'm just using all right clicks and I'm able to, you see it logging in, determining ports for the image, and going straight to run in the cloud all at once. So I think this is awesome it really shortens the developer's commute to the cloud by making those Docker CLI commands uh, run against Azure Container instances of your choice. So as you can see, it's running. So let's go to recap what we've learned today. A quick recap 
of where we are right now. We already managed to successfully put together all the code that we're going to use and later deploy as our microservices. We managed to do that by using the new Azure SDKs that allow us to easily interact with all of the Azure services that we're using in our application. Cosmos DB, Text Analytics, or Form Recognizer are just some examples of those. All of the libraries used consistent design patterns that made us more productive and made it easy to get started with new services. We also use VS Code and a Docker extension to quickly put together all of the Docker files we need to later deploy our application to the cloud. Uh, convenient templates and highlighting allowed us to set them up with minimum debugging required. As the next step, we're going to take a look at how to set up all of our infrastructure that we're going to need in Azure to actually get our application up and running. In the last demo, we took a closer look at the actual code that we're deploying. But as you could see there, we're actually using a lot of the different Azure services, but we've never really set them up. So this is something that we need to do right now and to focus on setting up all of our infrastructure. What we could do is just go to the browser and go to Azure portal and manu manually create all of the resources that we need. However, there is an easier way of doing that. Um, we're going to take advantage of Terraform, which is what you're looking at right now, um, which allows us to define infrastructure as code. Um, and it's a really convenient way of setting up all of their resources, especially in a deployment like this, where we have many different services to provision and we wanna make sure that we have all of the right settings in place. Uh, you can see that once we have that deployed, basically uh, we're going to have a lot of the different resources uh, with some variable name that we're going to pass it in. Um, it also allows us to, to define a lot of the different configurations, uh, you know, what kind of size, the, whatever each of the services provides uh, in terms of the options we can specify here, um, as well as the different access um, policies to make sure that uh, we only provide the right, the right access for each of the resources we need. Um, so this is a really easy way to make sure that we can first deploy and then redeploy if we need to have any changes in our infrastructure. Also, if you, know, you want to allow other people to use your um, project and use your infrastructure later, it's an easy way to share what kind of settings and what kind of requirements they actually need to get up to speed. So let's see how to actually um, get up and running with Terraform. Uh, the first thing we're going to need is to initialize Terraform. It's already up and ready. Um, the next thing we need to do is to actually make sure um, to create a plan uh, so that we can check if everything we've already specified here is correct. Already using things like the VS Code extension uh, for Terraform should make it easier for us to do to define all of these, um, but that's the next step for us to make sure that uh, everything that we want to provision is actually correct. And so as an output of that, we're going to have a Terraform plan. Once all of this stops running, uh, we're going to need to um, apply our plan. And then we should be able to see all of the resources ready in our subscription and ready in our account. All right, seems like everything is ready and in place. And we have actually quite a few things to, to create. Um, so as you can see here, the next thing we need to do to actually get it up and running is to apply the plan. This is actually going to take a bit uh, so in the meantime, I'm going to skip ahead and show you how it looks like once it's applied. I'm here in the portal 
And you can see that I already have the resource group that I provisioned uh, here in place. So let's take a look to see what's inside. As you can see, I have a variety of services that I'm using in my application. Uh, things like container registry, um, things like Kubernetes, app configuration, and so on um, that you saw me using in, uh, in the source code. Now, um, I'll let Uche explain why we actually need um, some of these services and how our deployment is going to look like. All right, let's take a look at the three platforms we've deployed our code to because they each serve their own purpose to help us run our app. So first, we have Azure Container Registry. The Docker extension helped us build images that we then push to ACR. I think of ACR as a repository for all your pushed images. A great use case is to create deployment pipelines that are triggered each time you push a new image, or as we saw with container instances, you can pull these static images directly into deployment targets to run them as containers whenever you want. Often, I get asked, why would I use Azure Functions instead of a single container in ACI or vice versa? Well, that's a great question. Azure Container Instances is unopinionated and takes any Docker file or any Compose file to spin up containers in Azure. Often, you see developers using this for long-running jobs such as workers. But when it comes to this Azure function here, we're able to write code that listens to and is triggered from events in our other past services. Let's take a look. So I'm going to click my function. And as you remember, each time a message gets sent to an Azure, to an Azure storage queue, this queue trigger function fires just once to notify SignalR. Functions are generally meant to do just one thing very efficiently. And because its infrastructure is managed for you and fully hosted in Azure, you don't have to worry about paying for a continuously running server. I think that's pretty awesome. Lastly, we have our Kubernetes service. As we've mentioned before, Kubernetes is a great tool for orchestrating and scaling microservice applications. Although ACI can run container groups through Compose, this is generally for a simpler application that won't need to scale or replicate. Let me take you to some of our workloads that are running in Azure. As you can see, AKS gives us the ability to use the full power of our microservice architecture by making each service individually scalable to meet elastic demand. Plus, if a service goes down, you don't need a technician to take a look at your on-prem server. AKS is handling that infrastructure for you. Now let's have a recap of some of the deployment technologies we've talked about. In our application, we use Terraform to provision all of our cloud resources in an easily reproducible way. This saves us plenty of time. We use the Azure CLI for smooth authentication and for running scripts that set up our resources. Another common scenario would be to use a CLI to deploy directly to an app platform. We stored our images in Azure Container Registry, which gave us a central store that we use to pull images into ACI and for our Kubernetes cluster. Azure Kubernetes Service is not only hosting our entire microservice architecture, but it also supports our cluster by providing health checks to remove and replace misbehaving or stopped containers. We also use our serverless function as a simple way to trigger updates to our front end each time results came in to our storage queue. So now that we've gone through deployment once, I'm wondering what we could do to make this process easier and more agile. I'll let Kate give us some tips. At this point, we have all of our application code um, ready for deployment. We have all of our infrastructure um, configured and in place. So at this point, the only thing that's really left is to put the two together and deploy all of our code um, using Kubernetes. Now you've seen Uche um, show you the Docker file and the Docker Compose file, which allow us um, to deploy things locally. But at this point, I would really want us to deploy all of our code um, into the cloud so that I can see how it's gonna look like in production. 
Now, we put in place uh, a couple of scripts that really make it easier for us to build the containers, push them to um, Azure Container Registry, apply it to Kubernetes, and deploy the Azure function. But to be honest, I don't really want to go through all this trouble with every single change uh, that I'm adding and making sure that I then remember to redeploy everything and hope it works. That is why um, in order to make my CI CD pipeline a bit more streamlined, I will set up a GitHub action. I am now looking at my repository where I keep all the code up to date uh, with all the things that we saw in VS Code. What I want to do right now is to create a GitHub action that every time I push a new change to the repository is going to build my containers, push them to ACR, apply Kubernetes, and deploy my Azure function separately. Let's click Add Actions. Here I see a list of all of the workflows that I've configured. Let's actually take a closer look at how my workflow file looks like. Here you see a couple of definitions that we already have in place. The GitHub action um, is going to work on push as well as uh, on a manual dispatch if needed. Here are all the environment variables I'm already providing it in order to make sure it functions properly. After this, I define what needs to happen every time the action runs. You'll see all of the different definitions and all of the different credentials that I need. It sets my Docker containers to build, generate all of the files that I need, get my Kubernetes cluster um, as target in place, and define how to configure it. We're using the images from Azure Container Registry, and we make sure that we're all set up in terms of using the right credentials and all of the, having all of the dependencies in place. After all of this, we run our Azure function. So now let's take a look at our site and see if there is maybe something we would want to change. Here is my application that I already deployed through my GitHub action. And you'll see that I have a selection of memes with different sentiment indicated by the color of the border. If it's green, it's positive. If it's red, it's negative. Here is a tricky one. And this one seems gray just because the sentiment from the text in the picture seems neutral. Now, considering I have green and red, I feel like maybe a better choice for my interface is to have a yellow border. I can now go back to my code that I have cloned locally and change just this one variable and see how the redeployment looks like. Here's the file that defines the colors for all of the different sentiments, depending on the sentiment that I'm getting. You can see that in case of a neutral, I am getting a dark border. I'll try to change it to warning, just so that it shows as yellow. Let me save that. Now I can use my source control tab in VS Code just to Stage my change and commit. Now that I push my change, I should be able to see in GitHub the push that I just did as well as the action starting to trigger. I am back on GitHub, and as expected, we have the push that we've just started about updating the border color. I can click in just to see where we are in the stage of the build. See step-by-step step, all of the different sections that we've had provided and the progress that we're making. This is gonna take a few minutes, so I'll just skip over until this is over. Now that my build is done, I should be able to go back to my page and refresh to see the new color of the border and 
correctly, we can see the yellow border this time generating. This was a really easy way for us to push changes, and we can do that as we develop new features in our application. One last feature that should make it easier for us to manage our deployments that I want to show you is Azure App Configuration. In its essence, it normally allows us to store a configuration for a given application that can be shared across um, many different services, many different microservices. You can use it to store your credentials, your environment variables, anything you want that needs to be accessed by all of them. In my example, I'll be using it for feature flagging. If there are some features that I want to enable or disable across my application, I can use it to easily switch between all of my different features. In my application, I will be using it to change the border style so that it's either dashed or solid. The only thing I really need to do to change it is to change the configuration that's stored in my app configuration. I switch to my terminal and after logging to Azure CLI, yeah, AZ login, all I need to do is to run the Azure app config setting that will set my value to dashed. Let's run this. You can now see that my value has been switched to dashed. After I refresh my application, I should be able to see all of my borders as dashed. In the last which few is minutes, now the case. we saw how we can easily manage all of our deployments so that we can easily redeploy all of our containers that makes our development much easier. And the way in which we can store all of the different settings and configurations in a way that's secure and convenient. Next, you'll see how Uche shows us how to monitor all of the different deployments to see how well they perform over time. All right, so when we talk about monitoring for cloud native applications, there are usually many different services running as serverless functions, containers, or in a large scale Kubernetes cluster. Everything is becoming more distributed and that makes monitoring the health of each service a real challenge. Datadog and Microsoft work together to integrate Datadog's best in class cloud monitoring solution with the Azure Cloud Platform to create a more seamless and integrated experience for customers. Azure is the first cloud platform to offer this integrated experience with a third-party monitoring solution. A Datadog monitor is now re a resource that can be created in the Azure Marketplace to ingest telemetry from numerous past services. So let's take a look at the Datadog monitor resource. When we click in, if we go to monitored resources, this gives us a view of all of the infrastructure and services that are sending data to data, the Datadog monitor within our Kubernetes cluster. I think this is super powerful and a great view. If we go back to the Datadog resource itself, we're actually able to click into, we're actually able to use our single sign-on sign -on from Azure to go into the Datadog website to actually view our Kubernetes cluster and you'll see we'll show we'll showcase the log explorer. So when I click this, we're actually using our single sign-on with our credentials to log into Datadog. Now if I go to log and analytics if I go to logs and analytics, I'm actually able to see the data and metrics for how our Kubernetes service has been being used. Again, this is a third-party application and it's super powerful to connect Azure customers with not only their resources, but any external resources as well. So without further ado, let's go back and recap um, what we've learned about monitoring. Observing services in production via logs and analytics is a best practice for keeping them running reliably. Just now, we checked out the third-party Datadog monitor resource and saw how well it integrated with our Azure Kubernetes cluster. When monitoring an application, 
Another great option is Azure Monitor. I'd encourage anyone to take a look at both options to decide which one works better as their monitoring solution. A service I highly recommend to use in tandem with monitoring would be application change analysis. This Azure service has saved teams countless hours because it tracks the details of an application's deployments, configuration, and infrastructure. Whether it's a small change to a config file or a deleted database, change analysis helps us figure out exactly what changed and when. That was awesome. And that's really all there is about building cloud native applications. You can get started today. Go to aka.ms slash build cloud native. I'm going to go check it out right now. See ya. Bye.